John speak. He is the author of an amazing book called Attack of the Theocrats, How the Religious Harms Us All and What We Can Do About It. I've told him he should have called it Attack of the 50-Foot Theocrats and homage to B-movies, but, you know. <laughs> uh, he's uh, served 10 years in the Maine legislature, so he knows how to play the politics game. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, and an incredible man, Sean Faircloth. I'm Sean Faircloth, and if you believe in the separation of church and state and the acceptance and inclusion of non-theistic Americans, uh, then you're my boss, and I work for you. Because Richard Dawkins asked me to work for you at the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science on the issues of separation of church and state. And really, I hope that all of us work on behalf of separation of church and state in this country, and that, in a sense, therefore, we work for the originator of that concept, Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson was a politician, uh, but he was a bit of a different kind of a politician. He was the kind of politician who took a knife to the Bible. Literally, he took a knife and cut out all the miracles from the Bible. Thomas Jefferson was the guy who said that the clergy dreads the advance of science as witches do the approach of daylight. Can you imagine a politician like that running for public office today? Because I want Blair Scott's daughter to run for office. I want people in this room to run for office because we need to make America safe for the ideas of people like Jefferson and Madison. It's not right now, but we're going to make it that way. That's what we need to accomplish. And, and this is not some minor difference. This is a pervasive difference when you look at the founders of this country. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, who said that in no instance have the churches been the guardians of the liberties of the people. And moving forward to Abraham Lincoln, who said that the Bible is not my book and Christianity is not my profession. Abraham Lincoln, who, when he ran for office, all the pastors in his hometown endorsed the other guy. Abraham Lincoln, who never joined a church and whose best friend and law partner, Mr. Herndon, said that Abraham Lincoln died an unbeliever. Now, I don't know if Abraham Lincoln was an atheist or not, but what I do know is that if Abraham Lincoln tried to run for public office today with the kind of statements he made, he'd have difficulty being elected to Congress, much less to the presidency of the United States of America. And that would be a great loss because his ideas are our, our ideas and we need to stand up and fight for those ideas in this country. And in my book, Attack of the Theocrats, what I intended to do with it is to offer you a simple toolkit, an easy toolkit, because this is a pervasive and important issue. They are lying on the religious right side all the time about the founding of this republic. And I want you to have this book as a toolkit that provides you a concise and easy way to discuss what the founders thought about these issues and how much aligned they were with our values. I also want to provide you with a toolkit so as yesterday when I spoke at the Reason Rally and talk about that the children are harmed or people in end of life are harmed by religious bias, not just religious bias in human interactions, but by re religious bias in American law. And concisely in this book, I have a chapter that you can use to talk to your friends and neighbors about these issues because I actually believe that most religious people are thinking people and are reasonable people. There are people in this room, in fact, we just heard about one, who came from a situation where they were religious believers, but reason can work, discussion can work. And when you take this chapter in the book and say, well, what about this one where the little girl died with the imprimatur of American law? That makes your neighbors and friends think about what really they are supporting when they support these religious values. And next in the book, I offer you another piece of the toolkit, 
which is a way of framing our issues in a ten-point vision of a secular America in which we reframe our cause to something that's very positive. We put them on the defensive. We take the moral high ground and then we say to religious people, which of these ten points do you oppose? Because we are the ones who believe that we won't take away anyone's human rights because of some 2,000-year-old document and I think America will come around to our perspective if we state it to them. Now, what we need to do, and I think this is so fundamentally important, is take the word morality back. We need to take it back. You know, in my parents' time, there were giants who walked on the earth. One giant was five foot six, and his name was Martin Luther King. And another giant was five foot nine, and his name was Robert Kennedy. And they spoke of morality all the time. And when they spoke about morality, they talked about those who are vulnerable, those who are oppressed, those who are the dispossessed, those who are in need. That's what morality meant. But since then, the word morality has been stolen by the religious right, and they want to lecture you about what you're doing with your naughty bits. That's not what morality means. That's not what it means. When I was in the Maine legislature, I sat on the Judiciary Committee where we oversaw issues uh, like discrimination based on sexual orientation and women's reproductive rights. And we had the religious right in the room lobbying us all the time on these issues, and they always used that word morality. But I'll tell you what, I think our morality is pretty darn good. Our morality with regard to sexuality, by the way, might include don't hurt anybody, make sure it's consensual, and mind your own darn business. And something that is deeply important to me is something that I find incredibly inspiring about Richard Dawkins. Because in my book, where I describe all these laws that hurt so many people in so many different ways, from the old to the young, but a particularly large measure of them have to do with children that are harmed because of religious bias in American law. And really an inspiration to me about Richard Dawkins is that years ago he talked about the labeling of children and stamping them as Catholic or fundamentalist Protestant when they're four years old. That concept, that thinking, is the kind of oppressive thinking that leads to the laws that I describe in my book that are so horrific and that in some cases, in the extreme cases, actually lead to children dying. So when people attack Richard Dawkins as being strident, I say, well, if you are being strident to protect the human rights of children, we need to be more strident about these issues. I really feel that he has a tremendously compassionate vision for the next generation and it is deeply important to him. And you really think about it. This man is one of the most renowned scientists in the world and he could simply sit in Britain and rest on his laurels and quite proudly do so and accept the praise he receives for the many wonderful books he's written on science. But instead, he has chosen really to be a unique catalyst for our cause. We saw a fantastic turnout yesterday and it was one of the most moving experiences of my life and we should thank Dave Silverman and everyone here for all of that. But I will also say that Richard Dawkins, the fact that Richard Dawkins decided to attend this event was a tremendous catalyst for its success and I can tell you I went as his opening speaker this last fall, and I'm going to be doing so again during the next couple of weeks. And last fall, we went to Eastern Kentucky University. This is rural part of Kentucky. 2,300 people showed up in that room to see Richard Dawkins. And as a 10-year politician, I'm looking at this room and thinking, Mitch McConnell, he's the senator from Kentucky. Rand Paul, he's the senator from Kentucky. But I put bottom dollar to you. If they said, I'm showing up at Eastern Kentucky University, 2,300 people aren't showing up. But when Richard Dawkins does, you see him. You see him. 
And my conclusion about that is that it is a social movement that is really cresting in this society. And when I went up and looked at this huge sea of people in Kentucky, they were so excited to see Richard Dawkins, but they were even more excited to see each other in the so-called buckle of the Bible Belt. They looked around and saw, oh, here's the skeptics from way out in Louisville, and it was a drive from Louisville, and the atheist group from Lexington, and a humanist group from every place else, all meeting each other, shaking hands. It is a catalyst for a social movement, just as our website is a catalyst for a social movement, and it is his tremendous generosity. And one thing that I hope to do, the role that I hope to serve on uh, his behalf at the Richard Dawkins Foundation is to add that political messaging and strategy wherever we go and work with you in every single state of the union. Work to organize in all 50 states of the union so that we have a social movement and so that when the next legislator is there, when the young people are serving in the main legislature, in the Florida legislature, in the Alaska legislature, you know what they'll see? They'll see a religious right lobbyist, but they will see a lobbyist for us in every State of the Union. That's what we're going to accomplish. And so I ask you to help. When we go, we're going to be barnstorming from here. We're going to Georgia. We're going to North Carolina. We're going to rock beyond belief. Tell people to attend that event and support our military down at Fort Bragg. Let's support our military. Then we're heading out to Seattle on April 1 and Santa Barbara on April 4 and San Diego on April 6. And we will come back again and Richard will come back again because of his generosity. But I am asking you, if he can devote so much of his time, this world famous scientist, I am trying to do everything I can in devoting my life to this cause. And I am asking every single one of you in this room to go talk to your neighbors and say, really? How about those children who died? Will you join us? Will you help us? I have no fear about being a proselytizer for justice, for humanity, a proselytizer for atheism. Let's all stand up and do that. Let's do it together. And when you do that, when you talk to your friends and neighbors, I hope that you will have in the back of your mind what thanks we owe to the man I introduce now, one of the greatest scientists alive today and one of the most tremendous leaders for our movement, Professor Richard Dawkins. Thank you, thank you, Sean, for that wonderful piece of exaggeration. I'm most grateful. <laughs> it's customary to uh, begin by saying what a hard act to follow. Uh, I unfortunately have two hard acts to follow, uh, Lawrence Krauss and Sean Faircloth. Um, Lawrence has given us a, a spectacular vision of the universe in which we live and the utter superfluity of any naive notions of supernatural creators or anything like that. We are now armed by physics to face the non-entity which is theology. Sean's book, Attack of the Theocrats, uh, with its wonderful plan for the future, I commend to you as a manifesto for our movement. So please get Sean's book. I, before coming here, I uh, was at the NBC studio in Washington taking part in a live television broadcast and it proved to be a very interesting discussion uh, involving uh, Steven Pinker, among others, uh, Susan Jacoby, uh, various other, other people. And uh, I decided that I would um, discard the prepared talk that I was going to give with a keynote presentation, um, and that I would talk about issues that arose out of that because it was such an interesting thing. But the most interesting thing that happened in this morning's broadcast came right at the end, and I want to uh, call your attention to that first. We in the Richard Dawkins Foundation are very proud of our association with the clergy project. 
The Clergy Project, as many of you may know, is a project to encourage and embolden those many clergymen and women who have lost their faith and are on the verge of coming out to their congregations, to their families, uh, which is a highly difficult and courageous thing to do. Uh, it's one thing for all of us in here to come out as atheists or free thinkers uh, and perhaps upset families, perhaps upset friends. But imagine you're in the position of somebody who has spent your life as a clergyman or woman, whose entire career, whose livelihood, social circle, everything about your life depends upon, is identified with the fact that you are a member of the clergy. It takes real courage to recognize the truth about the universe which you have discovered by looking at the evidence and to come out. And at the end of the NBC broadcast this morning, one of our Clergy Project members publicly came out as a non-believer. And I have hopes that maybe others will soon follow. Uh, so I would like to ask Pastor Mike Aus to stand up and be honored by this crowd. It, Mike, are, are you here? There is a brave man. And as I say, I hope there may be other others who will soon follow. I was a little bit worried after my talk yesterday at the Reason Rally whether I perhaps went too far. Um, I, I, um, there, is a, there is a fine balance to be drawn between being too strident and not strident enough. Um, and I, I uh, a little bit worried about whether my what I talked about, uh, respect and lack of respect and things like that, went too far. So what I thought I would do is, since it arose in the NBC broadcast this morning, is raise with you the dilemma that I feel in myself. I'm genuinely torn as to what's the right tactic. It's really a matter of political tactics, I think. And so I want to share with you the thoughts that are going through my head in, in my genuine doubt. Um, yesterday, I, I quoted Johann Hari um, as saying, I respect you as a person too much to respect your ridiculous beliefs. And I do want to make this distinction between showing disrespect for individuals and showing disrespect for what they believe. Uh, I don't think it's obvious that we should regard a person's, particularly a politician's, private religious beliefs as somehow off limits. There is in this country a culture which in, it, it's, I think is easily confusable with the very laudable separation between church and state. There's a culture that says that a politician, for example, is entitled to private religious beliefs which should not be on the table, which should not be debated, which should not be questioned in public debates. And I think I may be in a minority even in this hall on this question because the, it does run very deep in American culture that religion is a private matter which should not be on the table in public debate unless it's actually deliberately put on the table by the believer himself. Suppose we take a voter who is deciding who to vote for, and you look at the publicly stated policies of the candidates that you're offered, and you look at their taxation policy, their military policy, their economic policy, and so on, and all that's public and that's absolutely accepted, that that's what we should talk about. But suppose you know that privately, 
it, it's been made publicly available, but their private belief is something utterly ridiculous. Equivalent to believing that you are Napoleon. <laughs> Suppose that the person that you're thinking of voting for believes that a 19th century man dug up some golden tablets <laughs> written in some unknown language which he was able to translate with the aid of a magic stone in a hat. A 19th century man who, with the aid of the magic stone, translated not into 19th century English, but into 16th century English. What's that about? <laughs> and you're faced with voting for somebody who, whether or not you like his taxation policy, his monetary policy, his business policy, anything else, believes that story about the magic stone in a top hat. Do you want to entrust your country to a man who is capable of holding a totally ridiculous belief? Or is it private business, nothing to do with us? Is it private and therefore should not be on the table, should not be asked? Suppose his rival for the nomination of his party believes that when a priest blesses a wafer, it literally turns into the body of a first century Jew. <laughs> literally believes, literally believes that wine turns into the blood of that same possibly existent individual. Whether or not you support the policies of this candidate, do you want to entrust the governance of your country to somebody who's capable of believing something so absolutely mad, crazy, bonkers? <laughs> or is it a private matter that we have no business uh, inquiring into? Now, the most articulate and most praiseworthy uh, expression of this view that religious views of politicians should be private was expressed by John F. Kennedy when, uh, it, when the fact that he was Catholic was a controversial issue and he felt it necessary to say that his Catholic beliefs uh, would not influence his policy and of course they didn't. I want to express skepticism about whether a man as intelligent and well-educated as John F. Kennedy really did believe that a wafer turned into the body of Jesus and that wine turned into the blood. So when I, when I say that that belief in transubstantiation is ridiculous, I am not saying that I think John F. Kennedy was, was ridiculous. I don't think he believed that for one moment. What I am saying is that maybe we shouldn't be quite so reticent about asking people when they say they're Catholic or when they say they're Mormon or when they say they're whatever it is, Pentecostalist or whatever, don't just say, ah, yes, all right, that's private. We won't ask any more questions. Say, oh, you're Catholic, are you? Do you really believe that a wafer turns into the body of Jesus? And my guess is that they'll say, oh, no, of course I don't. But that's what we want to get them to say. We want to get them to admit that actually, although they call themselves Catholic or whatever it is, they really are not Catholic. Because if you commit yourself to being Catholic, then you are committing yourself to a whole lot of beliefs which uh, need to be at the very least defended. So I think the doctrine that religious belief should be regarded as private, off limits, off the table, should be challenged. And I'm asking people, don't go along with this convention that we don't, it's not somehow not polite to talk about somebody's religious beliefs, because religious beliefs are immensely 
important. Not only do they influence people's moral judgments, as we've seen, but they also constitute a worldview, a view of the universe, a view of the, a view of the, of the world, which is a relevant and important part of that person's identity. And so I'm asking you, do we really want to leave that as, as a private matter, never to, be, uh, never to be questioned? This matter arose in Britain recently when the British branch of the Richard Dawkins Foundation conducted an opinion poll. And we did this because uh, Britain, as you know, does not have a constitutional separation between church and state. Uh, the Church of England is an integral part of the governance of Britain. The Queen is the head of the Church of England. There are 26 bishops who sit in Parliament as of right because they are bishops. Uh, you have to go as far as Saudi Arabia, I think, to find another place, or Iran to find another place where clerics automatically sit in parliament because, of their, uh, because they are clerics. In Britain, we have a census every 10 years, and in the 2001 census, 72% uh, of the population ticked the box labeled Christian. That fact has been used in the 10 years since then by politicians and by prelates and preachers and bishops to justify Christian policies in Britain. Britain is a Christian country. 72% tick the Christian box in the census. So when the 2011 census came along, we suspected that the same thing would happen, tried to run a campaign to have the religion question removed from the census, but it wasn't. So we fell back on plan B, which was to commission an opinion poll by Ipsos Mori, which is a very respected and respectable polling organization, to question those people who ticked the Christian box in the very week after the 2011 census to find out what they really believe. And this is what I'm encouraging you to do in this country. When you meet somebody who says they're Catholic or Muslim, whatever it is, ask them what they really believe. We asked the people who ticked the Christian box in the census what they really believe. The first interesting fact is that that figure of 72% seems to have dropped in the 10 years since 2001 to 54%. But that was, only, that was only the first step in our investigation. We wanted to then take that 54%, the people who tick the Christian box, and ask supplementary questions to say, what does it mean to be Christian? Are you really Christian? Do you, really, do you go to church? Do you read the Bible? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Um, why did you tick the Christian box? And the 54% then drops dramatically to a much smaller percentage when you measure any of those indices of, of whether these people really are uh, Christian. Perhaps the most um, amusing of those results is when we ask them what is the first book of the New Testament. And they didn't even have to remember that it was Matthew. All they had to do was tick, was choose a, a multiple choice of four. We gave them Matthew, Genesis, Acts of the Apostles, and Psalms. Only 35%, not of the British people, only 35% of the 54 who ticked the Christian box could identify Matthew as the first book of the New Testament. Now, of course, it's not important what's the first book of the New Testament, but it does at least suggest a certain disconnect from the Christian culture which they, which they postulate. And the same goes for the answers to all the various other questions that we, that we asked. We specifically asked them, why did you tick the Christian box? And we offered them things like, because I believe Jesus is my Lord and Savior, because I believe in the teachings of Jesus, and so on. But the most popular answer to that question was, oh, well, I like to think of myself as a good person. That's a reason for ticking the Christian box. So that if politicians want to say 54%, it's only 54 now, 54% of the British people are Christian, the majority of people who tick the Christian box did so thinking that because they try to be a good person, that means they ought to tick 
the Christian box. But it gets worse, or better, depending which way you look at it. We also ask them, when you are faced with a moral dilemma, when you're faced with a question of right and wrong, to what do you turn? Do you turn to your religion in order to decide the answer to a moral dilemma? Only 10% of the 54% said they turned to their religion when faced with a moral dilemma. The most popular answer to that question is one that I think many of us might share. Uh, they turn to their innate moral sense of what is right and wrong. And the next most popular answer was, I turn to advice from friends and relations. So after our opinion poll, it will no longer be possible for politicians in Britain to claim that Britain is a Christian country and therefore to uh, promote Christian policies and Christian values. Now, we've been accused of trying to dictate to people who want to call themselves Christian whether they should be allowed to call themselves Christian. That's not the point. They can call themselves whatever they like. The point is that they should not be hijacked by bishops, by prelates, by politicians who want to use their numbers as evidence that Britain is a Christian country and therefore that Christian policies on, for example, abortion, uh, the right to die, uh, and that kind of uh, uh, stem cell research and things like, like that should be, um, they should not be allowed to hijack the percentage figure that comes out of the uh, census. Well, <laughs> that, was, that was Britain. And I, I, I want to, to leave you with the thought that the same is probably true of this country as well. And do not let the Christians, the Muslims, the religious people of, what, of whatever stamp hijack the great majority, as I believe it to be, of people in this country who may vaguely say they're Christian because they were baptized or whatever it might be, or because they like to think of themselves as a good person. We mustn't let them hijack those people. And perhaps one of the ways to make sure that doesn't happen is to don't accept what somebody tells you when they say they're Christian. Ask the supplementary question. You mean you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Oh, well, no, I, I didn't really mean that. I just meant um, I just meant I like to be a good person or I was, well, I was baptized or something like that. I suspect that there's an enormous number of people who are sort of advertised on the surface as though they were Christian, but actually are not. And above all, I suspect that that may apply, in fact, I'm absolutely sure it applies, to uh, your elected representatives. There are 535 members of the United States Congress. It is statistically inconceivable that 534 of them are devout religious believers. Congressman Pete Stark is not alone. It's statistically almost obvious that there must be probably hundreds like him, who don't dare come out and say so. They are lying to their constituents because they believe they've been led to believe that it's necessary to lie about their innermost convictions in order to get elected. And so I would encourage people to challenge that, to challenge your congressperson, your senators, and say, do you really believe what you pretend to believe? Or are you possibly misled into thinking that you have to do that in order to win votes? So probably what we need to do, what you need to do, I'm not a citizen of this country, what you need to do is to work on getting the message across to politicians and everybody else that we, the people who sit in this room, are far, far more numerous than anybody realizes. You are a constituency, a voting constituency, a lobbying, a lobbying constituency, far more powerful than many people in this country believe, and maybe more powerful than even you believe. Thank you very much. <laughs>